welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, I'm excited about the Word of God tonight. In my time with God, I was just getting stirred up, if you will, and just having a good time in the Word of the Lord. And I also believe that the Spirit of God is going to move and do some great and mighty things as we open up His Word and as we find out more about God and diligently adhere to it in our lives. Now listen, not going to do you any good if you come just to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, from a tall person or a short person. Listen, let's get off of men and what men and women think. Let's get off of that sort of a thinking, and let's get on to God tonight. So if you would, let's honor the Lord. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord tonight in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're just excited about being in your house. God, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you for your presence, God. Where your presence is, there your power is, God. And so, Lord, tonight, as we open up your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open it up to us. Come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision and the wisdom and the direction that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. How wise you are that, Lord, you can speak a now word to every person in this room on an individual basis. God, that's just awesome. We don't understand it, but, Lord, we praise you for it and thank you for it. God, as we open your word, we pray that you open us up to receive, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Give us hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, Lord. We'll do our part and look into it, try and understand, gain knowledge, gain wisdom. Do our part, God, and we know you'll do your your part, God. We praise you and thank you for that. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, those that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would move among them as you would move among us tonight, God. Bless every Sunday night service that's going on right now and tonight, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you just speak to those congregations that are lifting up the name of Jesus as Lord, as you would speak to us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bible out. Open up your Bible to the middle of your Bible. If you find the Psalms, go back one book to the book of Job. Book of Job. Tonight I want to talk to you about a subject called an unshakable life. There are many things in our life that can come and try and shake us. Maybe you've had an experience. Maybe something's gone on in your life that shook you. And you thought you couldn't get through it. God has not called us to be a a person that can be tossed to and fro. God doesn't want us to have a shakable life. God wants us to live an unshakable life. There are many things that can shake us. One of those things could be loss. Loss of a job. Sometimes people just fall apart. I lost my job. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to provide for my family. I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. Sometimes a loss of a loved one. You know what? They were the mainstay in my life. They were what held this family together, and I don't know what we're going to do without them. Maybe it's the loss of reputation or character, something like that in your life, and you just don't understand what's going to happen now that this area of your life has been shaken. How about this? Letdowns. Sometimes letdowns can shake us in our life. Maybe there was something that you were desiring, that you were praying for. Maybe there was something you were going after. And all of a sudden you were let down and it so shook you that you got off of God. Tonight I'm here to tell you that God doesn't want that for our lives. He wants us to never let go of him and live an unshakable life. Sometimes we're let down by others and we we stop trusting, we stop believing. Sometimes there are letdowns and, and, and expectations that we had that now all of a sudden we were let down and so we let go. Are you listening? Yeah. I can remember a couple of times that things in my life have been shaken. There was one time I remember uh, right before we got married, actually. My wife, Pastor Jess, and I, we were getting ready to get married. Back then it was just Dan and Jess, no pastor in front of the name. And uh, we were getting ready to get married. And all of a sudden, the company that I was working for just closed its doors and moved out of town. And I was stuck without a job. Wasn't that fun, honey? Shaken, right? Things are just shaken. I remember a phone conversation. What are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to believe God. You know what I'm saying? We're just going to go after God during this time. We're not going to let it shake us. There was one time I remember a, a, a friend of mine came out that she was bulimic, was dealing with bulimia. And I remember the feeling on the inside. I just felt awful. And, and I was just, it was so unbelievable to me that I was just walking around for, for probably an hour and a half. And it seemed like there wasn't another person on the planet. And I was just thinking, Lord, what is going on? This person was a, a, a mighty person in the things of God. They were going on missions trips. They were doing things for you, Lord. And yet they're struggling in this area. And it, and it was trying to shake me, trying to 
trying to come after me. Maybe you were here this morning, you saw the video of my dear friend Tim. I remember the day I was here at church, and I got all of a sudden these text messages. I'm trying to take notes on my phone, and I got all these text messages, and I know that they were having a baby, and so I'm thinking that they're going to be fun texts, you know, the exciting texts, the texts that you want, you know, 10 toes, 10 fingers, uh, nose, two ears, two eyes, cute as a button, can't wait till you can come see them, that sort of a thing, and yet I, I, I get a text message that says, kick heaven's doors down for me right now. They're saying he has Down syndrome. And I was going to preach that night, so I went to my office to study, and I couldn't even crack my Bible open. All I could do was sit before the Lord and cry. Say, God, what's going on? God, this can't be. Lord, not, not, not my little guy, not, 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 not my little nephew that we're going to be calling him. And there are things that try and come against us in life that try and get us off of God. And yet God says, I want you to endure. I want you to hold fast. I want you to hold strong. I want you to be steady, immovable, and unshakable in your life. That's the kind of life God wants us to live. We see an example of a man in the Bible by the name of Job. I had you turn there to the book of Job, Job chapter 1. And even though things around Job fell apart, Job's life was torn to pieces. If you will, everything in his life that could have been shaken was shook. Only thing Job was left with was his own life. Let's take a look at it together. Job chapter 1, starting in verse number 1. It says this, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was, look at the testimony Job has. Look at this, look at this. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Oh, my goodness. This guy has a shining example of what we want to be in life. He was what? He was blameless. He was upright. He was one who feared God and shunned evil. Verse number two, and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. So he had ten children, if you will. Verse number three, and also... His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Can I just break that down for you? This guy was the Bill Gates of the East. In other words, this guy was filthy, stinking rich. See, we, we don't understand what it means to have camels and oxen and sheep and servants and all that kind of stuff. We think we're doing good if we got a home, two cars, you know, a dog and a cat and two and a half kids. And yet, here's a man who had ten children. Here's a man who had thousands of animals, which translated into today's, you just filthy rich. And he had the servants and he had all that. And look at this, this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Wow. Wow. This guy, we would have thought, had it all together. This guy, we would have thought, doesn't matter, recession come, recession go, he's going to be just fine. He's got enough. Family come, family go, he's going to be just fine. He's got ten children. Stuff come, stuff go, he, he's, he's, he's fine. You know, evil days come, no, 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 he's upright, he's blameless. He fears the Lord and he shuns evil. Something happens, we get lit in on a, on a piece of this. Verse number 6, drop down there with me, we don't have time to go through it all, but verse number 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, speaking of the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, for those of you that think that if you just get in church and there isn't ever going to be any problems, I want you to notice that if Satan can show up in heaven, problems can show up in your life. Let's read on. Satan also came among them. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Now, remember, God never asks a question he doesn't know the answer to. You think God was scratching his head saying, where have you been? How would you get here? What are you doing here in heaven? I thought I kicked you out. No, no, something's going on. Something's taking place. Something is happening. Where did you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Verse number 8, then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? God must have been reading the first couple verses. Or how about this? God has had his eye on Job. God knows who Job is. God knows what type of man Job is. God sees Job's 
works. God sees Job's ways. They're always before the Lord. Why? Because he's just and upright. He fears the Lord. And the Bible says that God looks after those who fear him. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. And this man, Job, shuns evil. So the devil didn't have any part in Job. Why? Because he was shunning the devil. He was, he was not going to have any part of it. And so the Lord asked Satan, have you considered him? Literally, have you set your heart on him, Satan? Again, God doesn't ask a question he doesn't know the answer to. So God already knew Satan had been walking around the earth and saw this man and didn't like this man. Saw this blameless, upright man and just said, ugh, I hate that. Saw this man that feared the Lord and wasn't afraid of Satan but shunned evil and said, I'm going to have to get after him. So here he is presenting himself with the sons of God before the Lord. And God says, have you set your heart on him? Have you considered him? Now, Satan doesn't answer yes or no, but we know the answer by what Satan says. Look at this, verse number 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, of course I've been looking at him. Look at his life. But he doesn't fear you for nothing. There's a reason why he is the way he is. Verse number 10, have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But now, verse 11, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Now, if God was having a conversation in heaven with the devil, I would kindly ask the Lord, Lord, please don't bring my name up. And yet here God is. He says, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, yeah, I've considered him, but he doesn't fear you for no reason. He fears you only because you bless him. That's all Job is about. Job is about the material things that you've given to him. Job is only about the blessings that you've given him. But if you wipe out everything he has, he'll curse you to your face. God says, oh, really? Let's take a look at it. There's a challenge. Verse number 12. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now I'm going to have to kind of paraphrase the next couple of verses for you. It's kind of crazy. Here Job is, and all of a sudden somebody comes to him and says, hey, I was out in the field, and a band of raiders came and just wiped out all the animals. Then another guy comes in, and he says, hey, I was out in, in, in the field, and all of a sudden fire from heaven came down and consumed all of your possessions. Then while he was still talking, another guy came in and said, hey, I was out in the field, and another set of band of raiders from another area came, and they wiped out all you had. And then while he was still talking, another guy came in, and he said, well, hey, uh, I was out over at your oldest son's house and, and all ten of your children were there eating and drinking and suddenly a wind blew across and the roof caved in and all your children are dead. Everything in Job's life had just been shaken. Completely ripped to pieces. Completely torn apart. I got to see something like this when I was in Oklahoma. My wife and I were driving in. As we were driving in, we were kind of checking out the lay of the land, going to Bible college, you know, and everything was new. And so we didn't know what was going on. And as we're getting closer to our destination, we noticed there's some outlets, you know. We said, oh, hey, cool, outlet stores. That'll be kind of nice if we ever need to go and pick up some clothes or, you know, any bedding or things like that. Get it at a discount. We're college students. We need that kind of stuff. So we're driving, and we see the sign next exit, you know, and just 0.5 miles away and 0.25 miles away. And then next thing, this exit. And we go driving by, and we're looking. And there's no outlets. And we're thinking, that's strange. Maybe we, maybe, we, maybe we don't know something. Maybe, oh, it must be way down the road. It must be, even though in Oklahoma you can see forever, right? And there's no mountains, there's no trees, there's just, that's it, you know? So we're thinking, we must have not seen it. It might have been around the bend, you know, and we just missed it. So we get into our, our destination, we start working, and there at work we said, hey, have you guys been to the outlets? And I said, there's no outlets. Yeah, we saw the sign. Uh-uh, no, those things got wiped out by a tornado six years ago. Nothing there but a foundation. See, Job had nothing left in his life. Everything was shaken. Everything was taken away. There was nothing left. It was just gone. But look at what happens. Look at what happens. Verse number 20. Drop down to verse number 20. Chapter 1. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground. Now, we would have stopped right there. Been bawling, squalling. We'd have been crying, Lord, why did you do this to me? I know I would have rose, tore my robe, shaved my head, fell to the ground, and just fell to pieces. 
But look at what happens. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Nothing left but a foundation. Are you listening tonight? See, it doesn't matter if everything in your life is shaken. It doesn't matter if everything in your life is taken. If all you've got left is a foundation, that's all you need. You can fall, but fall to the ground in worship of the King of glory. Once again, let me sum up for you what happens. Satan comes up before the Lord. The Lord says, see? See? Told you so. He didn't curse me at all, did he? chump. Satan says, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? Uh, Yeah, skin for skin. Take his life. Then we'll see what happens. The Lord says, his flesh is in your hands. Just don't take his life completely. Don't kill him. Satan puts painful boils all over his body, head to toe. Here's Job sitting in a heap of ashes, scraping the boils with a pot shirt. I mean, I can't even handle a paper cut. And yet this guy's sitting here with a pot shirt, scraping boils off of his body. Job chapter 2, verse number 9. Look at what happens. Verse number 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Have you still not moved, Job? Everything's been taken, everything's been shaken, and you're still holding on to your integrity. Look at what she says. Curse God and die. My goodness. Job, verse number 10, looks at her, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. It's not my wife. It's not how we act. That's not how we live. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? And look at this statement. Look at this next statement. In all this, in all what? In all of that Job said and in all that Job did. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In all the shaking, in all the quaking, and in all the taking, Job did not sin with his lips. He wouldn't allow it to get him off God. He never stopped. He fell down and worshiped the Lord. And then he sat and he maintained his integrity. What is that? That is an unshakable life. That is an unshakable life. He refused to curse God. So tonight, I want to put a statement up for you on the overhead. An unshakable life is based on the unshakable kingdom, the eternal word, and the unchanging king. If you're taking notes, you can write that down or jot it down in your phone, whatever you're doing, taking notes on. But we're going to launch from that statement tonight. An unshakable life is based on the unshakable kingdom, the eternal word, and the unchanging king. See, if we're going to live an unshakable life, it can't just be any way we want to live it. It's not going to be good enough because, see, our ways are not his ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And it's not about what we see as stable. It's about what he says is stable. It's not about what we see as unshakable. It's about what he says is unshakable. And therefore, if we're going to live an unshakable life, it's got to be based on the unshakable kingdom, the eternal word, and the unchanging king. Let's take a look at them individually. First one for tonight is the unshakable kingdom. The unshakable kingdom. You're there in the Old Testament. Turn to the book of Hebrews. I don't know what it is about taking a sidestep from Hebrews in the morning, but it's just like I just got to get back to the book. So Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Once you get to Hebrews, go to chapter number 12, verse number 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 28. If you read the verses surrounding it, it talks about how God shook the heavens, shook the earth, going to shake it once again. Verse number 28 comes along and says this, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. With reverence and godly fear. With reverence and godly fear. See, just like Job, Job had a fear of the Lord. Job had no fear of man. 
He had no fear of the devil. Didn't matter what Satan brought against him. He served God with reverence, fell down and worshiped the Lord and godly fear. He was afraid to offend God with his lips. Therefore, he didn't sin in all that he spoke. And at the end of the book, if you read the end of the book of Job, Job ends up having to pray for his friends because God says, you guys didn't say what was right about me. Job said what was right about me. And if Job prays for you, then I will take the curse off of you because Job stuck to his integrity. He stuck to his guns. He didn't let it shake him. He had a foundation. An unshakable kingdom. Because of that unshakable kingdom, it says, let us have grace. What is that? That's God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. See, we can't handle the problems on our own. Not strong enough. Not smart enough. Don't have enough resources. Don't have enough wealth or intelligence or knowledge. Don't have enough connections. See, we've got to rely on the greater one. We've got to rely on someone who has more resource than we could ever imagine, the one who has the endless supply, the God who is more than enough. And we've got to operate according to the unshakable kingdom and not our own ways. Why? Because our own ways are shaky. They're sketchy. Society says one thing one day, another thing the next day. You know, it, 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 honestly, when I had kids, this was an eye-opener for me. My, my children, I love my children dearly, and so I wanted to do everything right. You know, and as a parent, you're always, like, concerned about, am I doing this the right way? Am I, am I being too stern, too strict? Am I not being strong enough? You know, am I, am I saying the right things? Am I putting the right time in? Am I feeding the right diet? And you're kind of freaking out. Now, to add to this, when you go to the doctor's office, they have a million pamphlets up on the wall telling you about every scary, fearful thing that could ever happen to anybody on the planet since the history of time beginning. And it's like you're sitting there and you start just, put, I mean, you just grab all this, they're sleeping, okay? And you start reading about sleeping, your child can die in their sleep and all of a sudden it's like gripping your heart, oh my goodness, if I don't lay my baby down the right way in the crib, they're going to die. All of a sudden the shaking's starting, Right? And if you read the pamphlet in the same pamphlet, and my wife can attest to this. Is this not true, honey? In the same pamphlet, I read, do not lay your baby on its belly because it could cause death. And do not lay your baby on its back because it could cause death. Is that true? Did the same pamphlet said, don't lay them on their belly. Don't lay them on their back. Oh, my goodness. I'm freaking out. I can't lay my baby down. It's going to die, you know? And, and it's just like that, and on and on and on and on and on. And it said, don't leave the baby alone. The baby could die. Don't sleep with the baby because the baby could die. And I'm just thinking, finally, I threw my hands up in the air and said, listen, baby's going to die somehow or another, one day or another. But listen, doesn't matter what the world says. matters what God says. I'm just going to have faith and put the kid down the way that the kid falls. <laughs> I still got three. Still got three. All right? Haven't lost one yet. Still not sleeping through the night, but we're, hey, we're getting there. Hallelujah. So what does this mean to us? we got an unshakable kingdom. It means seek first the kingdom. Everybody say seek. seek. Everybody say seek. seek. Seek first the kingdom. In other words, when things come against your life to shake you, you seek. Things start shaking, you start seeking. Get it? Yeah. Seek first the kingdom. There's a priority. Finances are shaking. We start seeking. What would you do? Call the bank. Look at our accounts. God says don't start seeking there. Start seeking here. See, we've got to seek first the kingdom. Marriage starts getting messed up. We start seeking. Dad, mom, what would you do? Friends at work, what would you do? Have you ever had this? Can't believe this. All of a sudden, we're getting all this stuff poured into us. Well, they should respect you more. Can you believe they said that? All of a sudden, now your heart is starting to be turned away from your spouse rather than towards your spouse, and we're getting shook up in our marriages. Why? Because we haven't sought first the kingdom way. Don't do marriage everybody else's way. Don't do marriage the world's way. The world is trying to redefine marriage and tell you marriage is not necessary and tell you just cohabitate, just do your own thing, however you want to do it. Oh, if you, if you get married and you're not compatible, you can always get a divorce and go find somebody else. Lots of fish in the sea. No, God says do marriage my way. Why? Because I'm the originator. originator. I'm the creator. I'm the one who wrote it out. And therefore, if you do it my way, it'll be blessed. My goodness, 
Finances, do finances God's way. Not our way, do it God's way. You say, but God's way doesn't make sense. Take 10%, you live off the 90%. How are you supposed to live on the 90%? I couldn't even live on the 100%. Now you want me to take 10% out and live on the 90? That's going to be even less. And yet, those of us that have trusted the Lord in this, like the Bible says, and have put in that 10%, all of a sudden the 90% somehow expands like a sponge in water. All of a sudden it grows, and it fills up every need. And we can say, I've never lacked, never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I got more than enough. Why? Because I did it God's way. Here's a tough one. How about this? Love and forgiveness. Oh, you do love and forgiveness the world's way. Hey, I'll love you as long as you love me. I'll be nice to you as long as you're nice to me. But you cross me. Uh Uh-uh. You are cut off. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. And yet God comes along and says, I don't want you to do love and forgiveness that way. I want you to love everybody. Everybody, Lord? Yes, everybody. Even him? Yes, even him. But I don't like him. God says even him. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and spitefully use you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Oh my goodness, now all of a sudden I have to not only love him, I have to pray for him. What's God doing? God's saying, as you pray for him, your heart will change and you will start to love him. Oh, wow, what about forgiveness? Forgiveness, oh no, I, I cut it off. Oh, I'll be the bigger one. I'll forgive this time, but next time, mm-mm. My son came home from school one day. He said out there on the playground, they, they would have to, you know, make up and that sort of a thing. And so they started saying something. They say, I forgive you, but don't do it again. I'm thinking, what is that? Where do we come up with that? No, I forgive you and I love you. Let's work this out. Jesus said, if you're going to forgive the way God wants you to forgive, up to seven times? Oh, no, up to seven times 70. Wow. Now, some of us are not that good at math, but we know that's a lot. (laughs) God's asking us to stretch. Listen, church, you are capable of more than you know. Why? Because you have an unshakable kingdom. And as you seek first the kingdom, let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter number 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter... 6 verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is that? That's his right wiseness. That's the wisdom of God, the way of God. His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. What are those things? Well, do you read in the context of those verses, it's talking about where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. See, we run after all these things. We worry, we fret, we fear, and we do it in the world system. And yet God says if you seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. You don't have to worry about them anymore. Listen, that'll change your life right there. That'll change your priorities. That'll change your prayers. You won't focus so much on praying for the things and start focusing on praying the kingdom of God into your life, and all of a sudden the things will be attracted to you. Wow. See, at the end of Job's life, God gave him double for his trouble. If you read the back of the book, God gave him double his wealth and gave him ten new children, seven sons and three daughters, and his daughters were more beautiful than any of the women in the land. Now, remember, Job was already, before all this stuff happened, the greatest man in the east. So now the greatest man in the east was doubled in his wealth. That is just like blowing, mind-blowing. That is just uncomprehensible. This guy was so filthy rich that, that we would have just said, man, that, that's billionaire, trillionaire. We don't even know. He's just at the top of the Forbes magazine list of most wealthiest people in the east. That's where he's at. And yet God says, don't worry about those things. I've got those things under control. I can handle them. I can get them to you, and I can get them through you. But seek first the kingdom of God. Are you listening tonight? Amen. Amen. Second thing, after we base our life on the unshakable kingdom, second thing we base our life on, if we're going to have an unshakable life, is the eternal word. The eternal word. You're there in Hebrews. Turn back to the book of 1 Peter. Right after Hebrews, you'll find James. Right after James, you'll find 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Talking about the eternal word of God. Base our life on the eternal word of God. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 24. 
Verse number 25. Peter's talking about our salvation, talking about how we've obeyed the Lord. We have a pure heart. We've been born again, not of corruptible seed, incorruptible. Through what? The word of God which lives and abides forever. Verse 24, because all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. Now see, what is that talking about? That's talking about shaking. It's talking about things being shaken, things being moved, right? The sun scorches, the wind blows, and that grass just withers up, it dies, and it fades away, it's gone. Here one day, it's beautiful, oh, we love that, and yet, next day, it's scorched, it's withered, and it's gone. All of its beauty fails. But take a look at the next verse, look at this. But the word of the Lord endures for a little while. I'm sorry, it endures for a couple years. No, oh, just, it endures just for your lifetime, but then it stops. Oh, no, I'm sorry, what does your Bible say? Forever. Forever. The word of the Lord endures forever. That means that there are a couple things we can take with us into eternity. Number one, we can take the souls of men because we know that they are eternal. God has made each and every one of us eternal beings. And therefore, if we're going to go to heaven, we might as well take as many people with us as we can. But also, you can take the word of the Lord with you into eternity. That means that it's unchanging. That means that it's unshakable. And when you have the word of God in your life, now all of a sudden you've got something that cannot be moved. Hallelujah. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. So what do we do with the eternal word? See, just like the unshakable kingdom, we had to do something with that unshakable kingdom. One thing to know that there's an unshakable kingdom, another thing to seek first the kingdom. So we know that the word is eternal. We understand that. We know that this is the living word of God which endures forever. But what do we do with that? You've got to speak the word. See, you seek the kingdom, and you speak the word. Are you listening? Don't just read it. Don't just comprehend it. Don't just remember it. Don't just meditate. You've got to speak it out loud of your mouth. You've got to start to declare the word of God. And especially, oh, come on, are you listening tonight? Especially, oh, let me say it one more time. Especially, when your life is shaking. Especially when your life is shaking. I don't have enough finances. Start speaking the financial scriptures. Why? Because that's eternal. Your financial situation is temporary. God can get you more finances. That's not a big deal to God. Start seeking first his kingdom, doing it his way. Okay, here's my tithe, God. Here's my offering. Lord, now I'm being a good steward of this. But Lord, hey, I'm going to speak the word because I don't have enough right now. It doesn't seem like I'm going to make it. But my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. The righteous shall inherit the land. See, all of a sudden you start speaking the eternal word of God and God hears his word and God has to perform his word. Otherwise, he'd be a liar and God will not lose his throne over a lie. No, God is true, and every man a liar, the Bible says, and therefore we got to speak the word. Kids start going south. Okay. Hey, I have raised them up in the ways of the Lord, and they shall not depart from it. Even when they grow old, even though they may wander from their borders, they will return. See, we've got to speak the word over our family. Health. Sometimes health can just shake us. Get a bad report from the doctor. All of a sudden, your life is turned upside down. But listen, you can latch on to, hold on to, and start speaking the eternal word of God that by his stripes, you were healed. The Lord sent forth his word and he healed me. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Devil, you've got no stake on my life. You've got no stake in this body. This is the temple of the Lord. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There was none feeble among Israel, and therefore I am healed in Jesus' name. See, these things come against us, and they try and shake us and try and get us off, and yet an unshakable life is based on the kingdom of God and based on the eternal word of God, and we've got to speak it. Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight. An unshakable life is based on the unchanging king. Who is the king of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty. See, there is no kingdom without a king. Our kingdom, our unchangeable, unshakable kingdom has a king that is greater than all. 
king that created all, king who is above all. He is the preeminent one. He is the one that is so much greater. He is the, 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 the high and exalted majesty. He is the savior of the world. This is Jesus. This is the one who was there at creation, crafting the worlds, forming them by the power of his word. Now he holds it all together by the power of his mind. This is the one who came to the earth, the God-man, God in the flesh, the one who lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life, the one who went to the cross, shed his blood so that we could be forgiven, and yet, by the power of the Spirit of God, was raised again to life and ascended on high and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God and intercedes on our behalf. And because Jesus is praying for me, my life will not be shaken. Wow. Remember the first time I read through the Gospels. I was there in the living room and I was reading and I, and I read the section of scripture where Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. What does that mean? Satan wants to shake up your life. Remember, Satan presented himself and God said, have you considered my servant Joel? Have you set your heart on my servant Joel? Now here's Jesus talking to Peter. He says, Peter, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat. And I remember hearing the whisper of the Spirit of God in my ears say, he's asked for you too. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck because at that time I had no clue what that meant to my life. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's asked. He wants to, wh why, why me? Why is he picking on me? I didn't do anything to him. I, I just gave my heart to the Lord now. I, and I'm reading the word and now I read this and then I hear that. It must be something wrong. I, I must be hearing voices or something like that. But then I heard the voice once again say, read the next part of that verse. What does Jesus say? He says, but I have prayed for you. Wow, Jesus is interceding on our behalf. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Oh my goodness, that means that when your life starts shaking, here's Jesus seated at the right hand of God and he sees your life shaking and he stands on your behalf and he says, Father, that's my child. Father, I'm interceding on their behalf. Father, they're ours. Come on, Lord. My goodness, my goodness. He's the one that makes my prayers acceptable to God. In the Old Testament, there's a beautiful picture of the high priest taking the blood of the sacrifice and putting it on the coals of the altar and then waving it into the most holy place where the glory of the Lord was. What does that mean to us? That means that here now the blood of Jesus has taken our prayers, that incest that lifts up into heaven when we pray. It goes up, and by the blood of Jesus, it's waved in before the Lord. See, God hears your prayers. God knows where you're at. Why? Because Jesus has brought up your name to the Father. Wow, 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 little old me, yeah, you, yeah, you, God cares about you, God loves you, and your king is wildly in love with you, you are his bride, you are the apple of his eye, he thinks thoughts about you, so many that you can't even number them as the sand on the seashore, my goodness, an unshakable life is based on the unchanging king, Hebrews chapter 13, back, back to Hebrews real quick. Great verse in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8. Take a look at this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8 says this. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, he's unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, I, 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 I thought, man, this is a great verse. I love this verse. I'm going to look it up in another translation. So I looked it up in the King James Version. Looked it up in the New Living Translation, New International Version, New American Standard, Revised Standard, American Standard, and I was shocked. I was just like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. You know what it said? King James Version, listen to this. It said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Shocking. New Living Translation said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was just like, oh my goodness. What's the NIV say? Well, the NIV says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, wow. What's the New American Standard Bible say? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
The RSV, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The ASV, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Webster's, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Reina Valera version says, Yeso Cristo es el mismo ayer y hoy y por los siglos. You say, Pastor Dan, I don't speak a Spanish. No comprende, what does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Woo! My goodness. My goodness. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Stick. Stick with Jesus. Stick with Jesus. Seek first the kingdom. Speak the word. Stick with Jesus. Seek first the kingdom. Speak the word. Stick with Jesus. Seek first the kingdom. Speak the word. Stick to Jesus. See, three little letters that start with S and end in K that will change your life. Seek, speak, and stick. You think you can remember that? Seek, speak, and stick. Life is shaking. Seek, speak, and stick. Children are going south. Seek, speak, and stick. Finance is not enough. Seek, speak, and stick. Health, seek, speak, and stick. Stick to Jesus. Stick to Jesus. Acts chapter 2. Turn there with me. Peter's preaching the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. Hello. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching. Holy Spirit's come upon them. Things are happening. Things are moving. Crowd is gathered. Peter starts quoting King David. Now, King David had a life that lots of stuff happened. King David had a life that was shaken from time to time. Had kids that turned their back on him, took the kingdom from him. In fact, the first king that was before David was trying to kill him most of his time. My goodness. Here's King David and messes up, and it cost people their lives, cost his son his life. Wow. Here's King David, numbers Israel, and and, and just thousands of people. Wow. Lots of things shaken in his life. And yet, King David says these words, Acts Chapter 2, verse 25, for David says concerning him. Notice the capital H on the word him. That means that King David prophetically is looking forward to Jesus and says something about Jesus in his lifetime. Look at what he says. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. What does that mean? He stuck to Jesus. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. See, King David knew a secret that many of us need to know, and that is, doesn't matter come hell or high water, I'm going to stick to Jesus. Jesus is my mainstay. Jesus is my foundation. And if I can stick to Jesus, nothing's going to happen to me in my life. I can handle it all because Jesus can handle it all. Tonight, what did we learn? We learned that an unshakable life is based on the unshakable kingdom, the eternal word, and the unchanging king. So how do we live that out? Well, we seek first the kingdom. We speak the word, and we stick with Jesus. Last scripture for tonight. Turn with me to the book of Luke. Last scripture for tonight. Luke chapter 6. You guys still with me? Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 6, verse number 48. Luke chapter 6, verse number 48, Jesus is speaking. He says, anybody who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will tell you, I will show you whom he is like. Luke chapter 6, verse number 48. He is like a man building a house. Aren't we all building our lives? Aren't we all doing something in life? Isn't our life like a house that we're building? He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation where? On the rock. Jesus is the rock. He is the rock of refuge. He is the rock that is higher than I. He is the rock that I run to. He is the one who poured water from the rock. He is my provision. He's my supply. He is the rock of my salvation. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, 
Not if the flood arose. Not when it came someday down the road. No, when. It's going to come. There's going to be things that come against our life. Jesus said in the world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. When the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house, look at these next couple words, and could not shake it. Could not shake it. Well, why? Why couldn't it shake it? Look at this. For it was founded on the rock. Listen, church, build your lives around Jesus Christ. Build your lives based on what? Based on the unshakable kingdom. Based on the eternal word of God. And based on the unchanging king. How do we do that? Well, we seek first the kingdom. We speak the word of God. And we stick with Jesus. Did you guys get something out of the word tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. What are our three words? Okay, let's all try that again. What are they? Okay, one more time. Amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord one more time. Hallelujah. Woo. God is so good to us. So good to us. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave. Let me just say this. You guys were great tonight. We had a great time. Praise, great time in worship. It's been awesome. You guys were wonderful listening to the word of the Lord tonight. I could tell you were right there with me. Thank you for allowing me to speak that into your life. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure before we leave this place that your heart is right with God and that if you were to die tonight, that you would go to heaven. You wouldn't go to hell. You say, well, you know what? I don't really believe in hell. Well, that may be convenient for you, but did you know that the Bible talks about hell? Old and New Testament, Jesus spoke of hell. Hell's a very real place. And just by ignoring it, doesn't mean it's going to go away. That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. If I went and st stood on the slow lane of the freeway, I'd meet one face-to-face -face sooner or later. You can't just say, I don't believe in hell, and it makes it disappear. Come on, let's talk. Let's make sure you don't go there. I don't want you to go there. You don't want you to go there. And listen, God doesn't want you to go there. It was never designed for us. It was designed for the devil and his angels. And therefore, we've got to find out, how do we get to heaven? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. And all roads don't lead to heaven like some would have us to believe. That's so foolish. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Listen, no, no roads lead to the moon. You've got to get there one way. Same thing with heaven. Can't get there our own way or some well-meaning church committee's way or whatever way we decide and hold to our truth and that's good enough. No, you've got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son, Jesus Christ? Don't you think that if he went through all that for us to get to heaven, that he would tell us how to? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people say, hey, that's good news. I, I, I know that the Bible says that good people go to heaven, and therefore I've been good enough, I think. You know, I used to be bad, cleaned up my act, now I'm good. And, and I've done a lot of good deeds, gave money to charity. And, and I think I've been a good enough person to go to heaven. Not like those other people, prison. The other people around me that I see, they're messed up. I, I'm cool. God's going to let me into heaven. Problem with that statement is, could you just show me where in your Bible it says that good people go to heaven? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, God lets good people into heaven. Be this good. There's no grading scale, no curve, no line that you have to be above, or, or this number of good deeds. You be this good, and you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. It's not like tipping the scale. If you got more good than bad, God says, oh, okay, I guess I'll let you into heaven. Listen, if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Come on, let's talk. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you know what? Not only have I been good, but I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, told me we were Christians growing up. Took me to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religion. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say in the Bible that you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're Christian. That makes you Christian. Nor in the Bible does it say you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, that America is a Christian nation. You get to go to heaven. Doesn't work like that. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Check it out. Where God is 
looking at your life and he says, well, you know, they're not anything else. I guess I'll lump them into the category of being a Christian. But you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, I get that. I understand that. But not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I'm in church tonight sitting in front of you right now, Pastor. You're great. I'm glad you're here. But just show that to me in the Bible. You sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It's like saying I could go to my garage, sit in the, car, the garage and call myself a car. Mm-mm. Just a man sitting in my garage. Never going to be a car. Doesn't matter if I make honking sounds and keep saying I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a car. Mm-mm. Just a crazy man sitting in his garage. Can't get to heaven just sitting in church. Call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, I understand that and I get that. But at my last church, I got involved. My last church, I sang in the choir for a number of years. I taught in the Bible classes. People thought of me as a leader. I made decisions in that church. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But just, just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you help out, sing in the choir, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You're involved, teaching the Bible classes. Or that you get a membership card to church and God is looking for your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven. It's not there. Nowhere. Check it out. Sometimes people say, ah, ah, got you on this one. I know God. And someone told me that if I know God, that means I'm a Christian. I know about Jesus, celebrated Easter and the resurrection, Christmas, sung the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you could do those things. Just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Because if you had read your Bible, you know the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible says the devil himself knows who God is. We saw that. The devil is in God's presence. And the devil can quote scriptures. We read that in the Gospels. Here's the devil quoting scriptures. That doesn't mean he's a Christian headed for heaven. Everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head that counts. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus made a statement to a religious leader of his day who, let me fill you in about this guy. His name was Nicodemus. He did a lot of good throughout his life. He was raised in his church called the synagogue. He got involved eventually. He attended every week of his life, he became one of the leaders there. He, he, he did the most good. People looked to him to find out about God. He, he was a teacher in Israel. This was a great man. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scripture. And yet when Jesus comes to this great man, by our standards, starts talking to him about this subject we're talking about right now, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now listen, I know at this time when we say the words born again, a lot of people turn off. They say, oh, I saw that on movies. I saw that on television. That's weird. I don't want to have any part of that. But listen, let's not let Hollywood and movies and television and internet and magazines and books, media, tell us what the definition of being born again is. Let's, let's find out what being born again means from the Bible. It's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible it means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? What does lukewarm mean? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not wholehearted for God, but you're also not against God. Listen, what is that? That's called riding the fence. What Jesus is saying is basically in or out. Because if you don't shut the door, I'll shut the door on you. Listen, only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. When I say the number three... I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. Now, when you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, yeah, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Did you just say you're going to point at me and count? I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be. But get over that embarrassment. 
Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one is that dumb, but the devil thinks you are. He's going to try and talk you out of it right now. Flesh is going to try and hold you back right now. Push past that. Grab hold of the unshakable one, the unchanging one, Jesus. Say, yeah, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus Christ tonight. I'll see your hand go up. I'll kind of put it right back down. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus. Beaten, bloody mess, hung on the cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus and given all your heart and your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God by simply acknowledging your need for Jesus and raising your hand. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or all over the world on the live stream on the internet. Hey, you can raise your hand right where you're at. God sees. And for those of you watching online, you can click the blue button, respond to God right afterwards, and someone will lead you in a prayer. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. God bless you. Three wise people. There's four. God bless you. There's five up in the family room. Gotcha. Six over here. Thank you. God bless you. Six wise people already. Where else? Where else? Six wise people already. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? I think I got you. Six. Thank you. Got you right over there. We're at. Thank you. Right here. Where that, just give me a little wave if that's you. Thank you, thank you. Got you, number seven. Anybody else real quick? Seven wise people already. Where you at, number eight? Number eight, you're wondering if you should do this. Come on, yeah, you should. Go for it. Eight, nine, thank you. God bless you guys. You can put your hands down. Come on, number 10. Number 10, you're sitting there and you're thinking, should I do this? Yeah, you should. Come on, come on. There's already nine wise people. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. If that's you, you need to give God all your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Come on, come on. Who else tonight? You know you need to do this. Heart's pounding out of your chest and you're thinking, gosh. Come on, go for it. Holy Spirit's tugging at your heartstrings right now. Will you respond to him by simply raising your hand? Anybody else real quick? Come on, number 10. Just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Where are you at, number 10? Come on. Come on, if that's you. Right now, a lot of them got saved. I don't know about this section over here, but come on, somebody over here. Where are you at, number 10? Saying, yeah, speaking to me. Speaking to me right now. Anybody else real quick? Come on. Come on, let's go for God. Thank you, number 10. We were waiting for you. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's give God a great big praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is so good. All 10 of you, or if you're number 11, 12, 13, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As we do that, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, hey, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get it in the aisle, and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. No one leave during this time. Let them come forward. Let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Come on down. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, you can come right now. Just make your way to the front. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on, come on. If that's you. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Somebody else, come on, we'll wait for you. Come on, come on, come on. If that's you, you need to do this. You just make your way to the front right now. Hey, everybody up front. Take a look up here. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. Listen, you came to give God all your heart. You came to give God all of your life. You're going to be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Now, how does that work? Okay, now listen, right over here to my right, your left. See this guy over here? This is Pastor Joel. 
Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to experience tonight, okay? He's cool. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to do three things. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free. It's a little book that our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. Sit down, maybe take 20, 30 minutes if you read slow. Find out what to do next in your walk with God. Listen, we invest more time in television, movies, books, uh, phone calls, internet, that sort of a thing. You can invest 20, 30 minutes into finding out what to do next in your walk with God. Then finally what he's going to do is he's going to give you a spiritual personal trainer. You said a what? Spiritual personal training. We call them S. PTs. Okay, basically, it's a friend. Someone who will come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible, one a week, that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Okay, he'll tell you how it works. It's easy and it's free. Now, listen, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year. One year of your life here at the Rock Church, sitting under the teaching here in the Rock. Give us a year. And at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, God will give it back to you. And you will be so blessed that you'll say, wow. I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everyone? See? They'll tell you. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go tonight. Hallelujah.